Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's lovely to see you all on this rather gray, grim day. Thank you all for coming. Ah, first of all, before I even start, I want to assure you I am not going to talk about the Middle East. I am not going to leave you sobbing in your seats and wishing you had never come. I, I promise you this is the season for hope and for peace, and that's where I'm going to go with this this morning. So you're safe with me. And, bef <laughs> yeah, and there is an applause there, thank God, someone just said. And, and uh, before we begin, I'd like to um, start with a reminder that, um, well, what we all need when we're facing adversity, facing difficulty, facing something big or small, what we need already is what we've got right inside us. You don't have to look anywhere. So please stand, if you would like, and sing this little light of mine. got the answer right there. We can all go home now. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome, welcome. For anyone visiting us for the first time this morning, a very special welcome to you. We're very glad you're here. We're a lay led congregation this year, so every service is going to offer something new, something different, and we hope that you'll enjoy this. You'll join us for coffee downstairs after the service. There is a welcoming table to the right by the library. Come and sit and talk and let us get to know you and uh, we can get to know you. So you're very welcome down there for coffee. It's on us. We are the North Shore Unitarian Community and our mission is to empower people to live with depth and meaning and purpose. And we aspire to live that mission with joy, with hope, with actions, and they're all led by our eight principles and the wisdom of many sources that we use to help us to help guide our way. Challenging subjects and discussions are both welcomed and enjoyed here, and can be certainly enjoyed downstairs for coffee after the service. We meet on the shared and unceded territory of the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people, and hold a reverence and a respect for this land and for those who hold it dear. Aware of and with respect for the past, we strive to move forward with truth and reconciliation in our words and with our actions. We all come from different places, from different walks of life, from different religions, different beliefs. No matter how you experience the sacred, you are most welcome and safe here. 
because here, together, we can find comfort and connection and love. We are, after all, walking side by side on our many life journeys. My name is Leslie Gibbons, and I was to be helped by my friend Carrie this morning, but Carrie is not able to be here. So I'm afraid I alone am your Sunday service associate this morning. Be kind to me. <laughs> this morning, we're going to look at some challenging ideas and some difficult questions about human behavior. And my first question to you is, why do humans choose war when peace is always an option? Or is it an option? Are there alternatives? What exactly does peace look like? Is forgiveness realistic and even possible? And finally, is love a viable solution to war or are we all just dreamers? Now, phew, if we can do this in an hour, I tell you, the UN will not have a patch on us. So please join Barb and me as we uh, light our chalice and say the words together that are on the screen, and I like it if we say them all, all together. There she is. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness, and may the warmth of sharing bring us peace. you. When we walk through those doors every Sunday, we carry with us our accomplishments, our celebrations, and also our worries, our anxieties, our concern for others, concerns for ourselves. So every Sunday, we light a candle of joys and sorrows, those joys and sorrows that are being held in our hearts this morning. And Barb is going to help me with this. And uh, my, my first joy this morning is to say happy birthday to Joanna Vaughn. <laughs> happy birthday, Joanna. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's very, very fitting for this service. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> and this morning, this morning, I'd like us to think of Nancy McMaster. She started the journey into the mystery, and she's very close. Liz and Carrie are with her now, day and night, which is why Carrie isn't here with me this morning. She's in the final stages of her life now, and she welcomes every thought, every, every thought that we can send her. She appreciates it and she loves it. So let's take a moment and think of Nancy and think of her journey, the journey we all have to take at some point. We also know that while we sit here warm and well-fed, there's a world on fire out there. And Barb has just lit our final candle as we take a moment to send our thoughts to those who need comfort, who need safety, who need some relief in our troubled world. If you believe at all in the power of prayer or that equivalent, Now's the time to say a prayer, because it's much needed, too. And now, if you would like, please stand and sing together, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Written by Pete Seeger, who was a Unitarian. It's a beautiful and poignant song that will introduce our first reflection. And the words are on your screen.
My father was in the RCAF during the Second World War. He was a tail gunner. He survived the war, which was a miracle. And when he first heard that song, it made him cry. Because there's a tragedy in that song, the tragedy that war will repeat itself over and over again, taking the young and the hopeful with it. And I want to offer a loud stop to that inevitability. And I want to offer a thought about how to stop that cycle. And I dedicate this to my father. So why go to war? Can we ever find peace? Can we ever forgive? And most important, what can we do to prevent it from destroying our future? So let's start at the beginning. Why do we do that? Is it just part of our human nature to fight? Like kids in the playground? Jared Diamond, who was a professor of geography at UCLA and the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, asked these questions, and he offered the following thoughts. And I'm paraphrasing here, and please forgive me for my oversimplification, but time is short. And I want to quickly get past war to what I feel this season in particular is all about and what our future could be like. We know that history unfolded differently on different continents and amongst different people. We know that one common denominator throughout the history of man is that man has gone to war. Why? As people slowly emerged from their hunter-gathering stages and settled in one place to grow their subsistence crops, societies organized themselves in a new way. With a steady supply of food came a growth in population, and then divisions within those populations, socially and politically. Well, more people needed more food, and that meant more land and space was needed to accommodate the population. Hmm. Slaves were needed to work the land and serve the people. And when more minerals were needed, people looked to other places for copy, coffee, uh, copper, tin, salt, gold. Those who were able to grow more nutritious food because they had an accommodating climate and soil and rainfall were among the strong, populous peoples and could do, and in fact did, what they wanted. Wealth and power became distributed with the exponential growth of food plenty, mineral wealth, and the advent of weaponry. Simplistic? Of course, yes. Why trade for it when you can fight and just get it for free? And colonial expansion was rampant throughout the continents that differed greatly in sophistication, technology, and political organization. And if you add to all of that religious self-righteousness, religious insult, and dismissal of those considered less than human, or certainly less important, then war becomes not just needed for physical things, but a question of honor, of faith, of missionary zeal, both religious or political zeal. We face the war of conversion or elimination. Add to that one final ingredient seen throughout history, the egomaniac, the zealot, the madman, and perhaps in the last two centuries, the scientist. Well, we're now in the present, and enough of that. Enough of the lecture. I'm sure I've seen a couple of you taking notes. There will be a test before coffee. <laughs> ah, oh my God, you say, will it never stop? Well, I propose 
that it could. And we're going to talk about that after we all stand up and sing at the top of our voices, please. The answer is blowing in the wind. By Bob Dylan, we all know it. Please stand and sing. You don't need that, you know the lyrics. <laughs> I learned a song when I was 16, maybe, 1971, uh, when Vietnam War was the biggest thing we, we were up in arms about. Funny metaphor. Um, and the nuclear doomsday clock that the physicists had was at, set at one minute to midnight. So that was 1970, 71. Um, and now I'm teaching this song to my grandkids. You know, this song is legs.70s. <laughs> I think it just must have been a great place to be. <laughs> and a lot of fellow protesters. <clears throat> well, I want to talk about peace. The answer that's blowing in the winds of change and in the hearts of all of us. And thank heavens for that. 
Many of you, I know, uh, will be familiar with Pema Chodron. She's an American Buddhist nun. She's the resident teacher at Gambo Abbey in Cape Breton and the author of many books, many of which I have. And she says, war and peace begin in the hearts of individuals. She also says, if we want there to be peace in the world, we have to be brave enough to soften what is rigid in our hearts, to find the soft spot and stay with it. We have to have that kind of courage and take that kind of responsibility. That's the true practice of peace. I particularly like those words, the true practice of peace, because I think that's very Unitarian. If somebody doesn't begin to provide some kind of harmony, we're not going to be able to develop sanity in this world. Somebody has to plant the seed so that sanity can happen on this earth. And here's the seed planted by Pema. Paraphrased, my apologies again. The way in which we as individuals respond to challenges in our everyday lives, the way we respond to challenges can either perpetrate a culture of violence or create a new culture of compassion. And I'll say that again. How we respond to challenges can either perpetuate a culture of violence or create a new culture of compassion. If we harden our hearts and then shut down, well, then we feel self-righteous in our acceptance of the fight. We don't look for peace. We feel self-righteous about the fight. War and peace both start in the hearts of the individual. Strangely enough, even though all beings would like to live in peace, our method of obtaining peace over the generations seems ineffective at best, hopeless at worst. We seek peace. We seek peace and happiness by going to war. War begins when we harden our hearts, and we harden them so easily in minor ways, and then in quite serious major ways, major ways with hatred and prejudice. We do that whenever we feel uncomfortable. We harden our hearts when we feel uncomfortable. It's, it's so sad, really, because our motivation in hardening our hearts is to find some kind of ease, some kind of freedom from the distress we're feeling. But, and here's the big but, and I can say that. <laughs> if we do truly want peace, we have to have courage. We have to have the courage to have a change of heart. Peace, peace demands we have a change of heart. If we cultivate and stay with a tender heart, we are cultivating the seeds of peace. Someone has to start on that road to sanity. Someone has to cultivate those seeds of peace. Why can't it be us? Right here, right now. Wise Pema Chodron explains that patience is a way to de-escalate aggression. Patience. Aggression and the pain that goes with it, patience will de-escalate. Because there's a seductive quality in wanting to get some resolution. We strike out, ironically, in order to escape the pain of aggression. And we create more aggression. And we create more pain. So, here's what to do, she says. Be patient and be fearless. Don't get hooked by that habitual response. Learn compassion. 
One meaning of compassion is to suffer with other people. Without the labels of you and me, friend and enemy, we all become the other. You and me, me and you. We're the same. So my suggestion to you, my challenge to you, is let's build a new culture based on love and compassion. Because that can build, that can build the way to find the peace that we long for. And I believe that we do. On that note, please stand if you would like, and we're going to sing another peace song. Let there be peace on earth, please. that song. So we have war and then if we're lucky we work hard. We have peace. But what next? Well I suggest it's forgiveness. Pema Chodron in her book The Places That Scare You <laughs> stresses the following wisdom. Forgiveness, it seems, can't be forced. But when we are brave enough to open our hearts to ourselves, however, forgiveness will emerge. And you can see where it starts again. The forgiveness starts in ourselves. There's a simple practice we can do to cultivate forgiveness. First. We acknowledge what we feel. I feel shame, I feel anger, I feel embarrassment, I feel revenge. Then we forgive ourselves for being human and for feeling those things. Then, in the spirit of not wallowing in that pain, we let go and we make a fresh start. And I know this is simplistic thinking and it's probably naive of me and certainly, I acknowledge it's difficult, really difficult. But, but listen, why not entertain that thought? Is it God? <laughs> Somebody is phoning. <clears throat> we don't have to carry the burden with us. We can acknowledge, we can forgive, and we can start anew. I see some faces of doubt in front of me. But you're thinking, I hope. Because if we practice this way, little by little, we'll learn to live with the feeling of regret for having hurt ourselves and others. We will also learn self-forgiveness 
And self-forgiveness is the most difficult forgiveness of all. Eventually, at our own speed, we'll even find our capacity to forgive those who have done us harm. We'll discover forgiveness as a natural expression of an open heart. Forgiveness is a natural expression of the open heart, an expression of our basic goodness. And I certainly believe in my heart, in the basic goodness of every human being. This potential is inherent in every moment. Each moment is an opportunity to make a fresh start. According to the Dalai Lama, forgiveness is a powerful practice because it breaks cycles of suffering. If you're harmed and you choose anger or vengeance, then you've chosen to respond to harm by causing more harm. But if you choose forgiveness, choose being the operative word, you can prevent further harm from happening. For example, if someone says something cruel to you and you say something cruel in return, then you both continue to suffer, right? But if you forgive them, you offer compassion, you have the opportunity then to transform that interaction and interrupt the ongoing suffering. Oh, so easy, easy, you say, so easy, you say, and so difficult to do. And isn't that the truth? It is really difficult to do. It's easier to slip into the anger and the self-righteousness than it is to slip into the forgiveness or the compassion. Here's what David White says in his extraordinary book that my friend Karen knows very well indeed, his Consolations. To approach forgiveness is to close in on the nature of the hurt. And the only remedy being, as we approach its raw center, is to reimagine our relation to it. I'm going to repeat that. We need to reimagine our relationship to the hurt. What does that mean? Well, forgiveness never arises from the part of us that was actually wounded anyway, right? The wounded self of us, our wounded self, might actually be the part of us that is incapable of forgetting and perhaps wasn't actually meant to forget. To paraphrase again, and it's always dangerous for me to do, but here goes, the part of us that's wounded eventually makes forgiveness an action of compassion towards ourselves as towards the other. And here's the important thing. Forgiveness is a skill. It just needs practice like every other skill. And to forgive ourselves, well, we have to reimagine ourselves and look at the past in the light of a new identity. And White says at the end of life, the wish to be forgiven is ultimately the chief desire of almost every human being. Yeah, the wish to be forgiven. So I contend we should all wear t-shirts. I have designed them. (laughs) Forgiveness start now. I made that one up. But I'm thinking of having one made for myself. If you want one, just let me know. Okay, we've got war, we've got peace, we've got forgiveness, what next? This is the best part. I love this next part. If I could sing, and I can't, and you should be very thankful for that, this is what I'd sing for you right now. And if Kerry were here, he was just going to gently strum on his guitar the melody to this. If I could sing, I would sing what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. So instead of singing that and clearing the room, 
I'm going to tell you about someone I admired very much, and his name is Richard Kapuczynski. He's a, he was, he's passed away now, a Polish journalist who spent a lifetime learning and traveling and reporting on many of the conflicts around the globe in the 20th century. He was a remarkable man. In his book, The Other, he talks about the nature of the other. A concept, he says, a concept that needs to disappear or at least be redefined before we can truly have peace and love. That concept of the other is a deadly one. But the operative word here is love. And I, I, I know that uh, Paul suggested that the answer to war might be compromise. And I, I said, no, <laughs> no, it's love. Kapuczynski witnessed every variety of ignorance and arrogance, and he knew that negative otherness begets war, otherness begets cruelty, begets mindless hatred. Only when we see the other as ourselves will there be a hope for peace. <laughs> he said building bridges of understanding is not just an ethical duty, but it's an urgent task for our time in a world where everything's so fragile, where there's so much pain. And right now, right now, a new other is emerging. And we see it every day. We hear it on the news. The radical and the cultural other. They're discovering their pasts and their myths and their roots, their sense of identity, and they're emerging in the world today. And this is our challenge. We need to learn to love each other as if the other is self. Hmm. Two opposing trends, right? Globalization on one side, cultural preservation, celebration of differences on the other. Ah, what language can we use now? How can we speak to the pity and the beauty and the pain and the wonder of others? What can bind people to each other and bind together humanity? Love, I think. Just love. It's the only thing there's too little of. Why don't we try and change that? Please stand if you'd like and sing one of the most wonderful songs ever composed by John Lennon, Imagine.
I choose to be that dreamer. I hope you do too. On that wonderful note, it's time now to collect our offering uh, for December. And for this month, our collection will be given to the Congregational Support Fund. It was formerly called the Pastoral Discretionary Fund. This fund is used to, to help congregants in need of support. And, and please, if you know someone here who needs help, or if you, in fact, need help, please contact Marga Hanna or me. For all you do to create this wonderful community of love and support, inside and out of it, we say thanks. And a special thank you for everybody who helped me go solo this morning. I really, really appreciate your help too. Now for announcements as we draw to a close. Next week, I hope you'll come and enjoy a morning of enchanting chanting with Dennis Cooper. He says it's gonna be a fine way to counter any Christmas shakes and quivers over our holiday and, and shopping stress. Together, Dennis says, we can reach a collective vibrational state, which I personally want to see. So I'll be here. Also this year, uh, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service here in the sanctuary. Um, it's gonna be family friendly, six o'clock Christmas Eve with music and stories and candles. There will be apple cider and treats. Don't know what they are, but I always come for the treats. Also, New Year's Eve, since New Year's Eve falls on a Sunday this year, we thought that instead of a service, we'd have a potluck brunch at 10.30. So please come along on that day, bring some food to share, and be prepared for some fun. And as a reminder, you don't have to worry about driving in the rain or the snow or the dark. Just call a cab, because we do have an account with North Shore Taxi. They'll bring you here, they'll get you home safely. And uh, if you don't have an account, just contact Janny in the office if you want to sign up for one. It's making a lot of difference for people that they don't have to worry about driving. <sighs> so for our closing words, well, by now you must you must think, well, you must know that I'm a dreamer. And I've been talking about what you might think is the impossible. We've talked about war and peace and forgiveness and love. But I urge you, I ask you to think about this. You don't need bombs and guns and missiles to have a war. It can be personal. It can be in your home, at work, in your community, or even inside you. I've known my own forms of war, and I've known a hard-won peace. Time has brought forgiveness, and then, out of all of that, has come love. I know this is possible. I know it can be true. The words of wisdom from Pema Chodron, David White, Jared Diamond, combined with those Unitarian words that we know and say almost every Sunday, worth, dignity, compassion, acceptance, truth, liberty, love. If we just find space and time for those words, I believe we have a chance for a war-free world, not just for one, but for everyone. And isn't that the message of this season that's a message of peace and hope and goodwill for all people? And we're the messengers. We all carry that little light within us to make it so. So please, let's send forth the flame and say all together as we extinguish it. <sighs> we extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of hope. The world calls us 
to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth in peace. Amen, amen. So be it. Amen. Please stand for our closing song, and perhaps because we are now in the middle of flu season, we may not hold hands, we may just link elbows, whatever you're most comfortable with, and let's sing our closing song together, Circle Round for Freedom. Thank you.